Will you welcome, please, the whirlwind himself, Jimmy White? I still love to do things my way. Unbelievably talented. Impulsive. I am not frightened of nobody. There's never been an axe. That's who I am. Jimmy's just a, a maverick, if you like. Jimmy sees the championship drifting away from him. So I was barring out of control. It was turbulent. I might have uh, killed myself with the madness that was going on. Born survivor, really. Well, Jimmy White pulls it off. I don't change to nobody. Welcome back to the assembly rooms here at Derby, and as promised, our first sight of the young professional making his debut in big time snooker, the 18 year old from Tooting, Jimmy White. We're we filming. And what an outstanding young prospect he is. English amateur champion when he was only 16, winner of the world amateur title last November, at the age of 18. Yeah, I'll just show you an old picture of me. Enormous natural talent. Young White's turn will come, I'm sure. I was 18, 34 years ago. And what can you say about this man's ability? Nice suit. Shoes have seen better days. <laughs> right, should we do a practice, yeah? Well, this is rather an extraordinary shot. I think Jimmy White is attempting to swerve around the blue using the spider. I don't think I've ever seen that before. <laughs> Always in. Jimmy White is indeed a star of the none too distant future. Natural talent. You never lose it, it just gets rusty. So what was it like to be 18 years of age and be surrounded by this circus? Unbelievably fantastic. I was getting, you know, getting a lot of attention. Um, you know, getting a lot of money, you know, and um, having a lot of fun. Even when you were an amateur, you had the reputation of being a bit of a rebel. Yeah. Was that a bit harsh? Were you rebellious? No, not really. I just think, uh, I don't think I was a rebel or whatever. I'd, I enjoy myself, that's about it. I'm not a rebel. I'd drink too much and I'd be out too late. And obviously, the gambling, you'd be gambling when you're drunk, so you're making terrible mistakes. And uh, But I sort of quietened down with the gambling and it went to the nightclubs and uh, messing about, you know, seeing that side of life. But it was just a lot and a lot of drinking going on. I can't really remember, to be quite honest with you. I was here, there and everywhere and, uh, you know, it was getting to stages where you're going to Marbella for the weekend and, you know, it was getting a bit wild. It was getting a bit too crazy, so um, it was getting harder to win. You know, and obviously the spending and you're not winning, you know, and his lifestyle still carried on. Losing made me more determined to try and win again, so probably I worked harder. How long would you be doing this for, for a match? Um, say half an hour, three quarters of an hour. I think he's the greatest natural snooker player that I've ever seen, and he's got a long life in front of him at the game, and can only get better, I would think, so who knows what he may achieve in the future. Do you have any kind of shot that you're particularly weak on at the moment? Um, no, but I've been playing well, I've been winning, I've not... I'm just, um, just the straightforward shots, I think, yeah. in practice, because uh, just so your cue sort of goes right through the white. It's just amazing the ability that he has. Uh, you know, Alex Higgins is a very exciting player, but but for me, Jimmy White has, has got all the shots. He's uh, he's amazing. He never ceases to amaze you when you're watching him playing. Well, I'm a little bit surprised that no. Jimmy taking the blue there. You'll have to get a snooker this very next shot. And that is an absolute cracker of a shot. And in the uh, final of the Mercantile, um, when it went 12 each, I thought, you know, what have I done to deserve this again? You know, can I win a tournament or not? And uh, lucky enough, I got a snooker on the last two balls. Well, once it took Mr. Snooker, I, I fancy putting the pink wherever the white landed because I, you know, I've I had a chance now and I just. Um, I wanted to play the shot and the crowd was going crazy so I like, paused for about five seconds and I just potted the pink and it was going even more crazy and I just had to pot the black. I couldn't wait you know, for them to settle down, I just knocked the black in. Well, Jimmy White pulls it off. His very first world ranking tournament win, he beats Cliff Thorburn by 13 points to 12.
you know, you couldn't get more exciting than that. But that's how my life and game has always been. Give me wide, ladies and gentlemen. You only had four channels on the TV. So, you know, everyone knew you really. So, uh, you was really famous. And obviously coming from a working class background and, um, you know, to you know, this whole world opening up, it was quite, you know, it was quite amazing. It was brilliant, you know, and uh, it was just a roller coaster for about five or six years, from, say, 84 to 88 or something. Is money important to you? Money important to me. Is it to you? <laughs> <laughs> a cheque for £36,000, ladies and gentlemen, the 1987 Dulux British Open. Yeah! Yeah! All right, cheque for £60,000. <laughs> I apologise. In that period, you really were like rock stars, weren't you? It felt like that kind of treatment, but obviously as you get on in life, you know, I met Ronnie Wood, who is a, a real rock star, and you realise what level you really are at. Oh, hello. Great. You look very smart today. Yes, mate. Even though Sullivan, yeah, to come you over come here and have, have a little knock. Grudge matches, I guess. <laughs> Jimmy just likes to enjoy his life. It's a bit like me, really. We don't like to feel traps. We like to kind of just feel like we can just go out and have an adventure. I met Ronnie Wood um, through our daughters were the same age and they was in the same school, they was in the same school play together. You just lifted your head slightly, did you feel that? Oh uh, yeah, I should have kept my head still. Yeah, just take your time with that. I heard he went to, his daughter went to the school. I didn't think he knew anything about snooker. Head down, can't miss. He used to try and introduce me to all sorts of celebrities. Oh. I think Ronnie Wood's wife phoned Jimmy White's wife up and said, can you tell, get Jimmy to get, bring, get him home? Because he just, him and Ronnie were out, you know, they'd, they'd meet at the school and boom, have a few Guinnesses and that was out for two or three days. <laughs> tell us a bit about the lifestyle that you lead, because it must be a bit difficult, you're away a lot of the time. Eh? Um, well, I am now, it's picked up again now. Like, um, I'm away about three or four days a week now, when I'm the country. But doesn't that put pressure on things like your marriage? And that's no, I take my wife with me. She comes with me, so... I suppose I've always been used to it. Uh, when I first met him, he went away a lot. So it's just uh, something that's always been there, so it's no problem. Jimmy, your family are playing a large part in your life, isn't it? Um, and then... Uh... James, you call me James. What about your daughter? Is she aware of what's happening, that Daddy's a bit of a star? She does realise, but she takes it in her stride. It's normal, so... He was quite a big celebrity in those days. But, yeah, yeah obviously, I don't really know any different, but I, I know, obviously, that it, it's not normal. Um, but um, I guess it was normal to me, type of thing. But it was all, obviously, um, late nights and parties, and I was obviously very young. Two of my daughters still live with me now, and um, we had... My oldest is um, 31, and then they go 25, 24, and 23. We had three children quite close. And me and my wife, we had, um, because of my behaviour, we had um, an up-and-down relationship, a love-hate relationship all the time. You know, we'd split up. I must have uh, refurnished 50 flats, you know, over the years. But, um, you know, she's a wonderful woman, a wonderful mother. It takes a special type of woman to live with someone like Jimmy. I mean, Jimmy's lovely and beautiful, but, you know, she must have been sitting there thinking, when, when is he coming home? It was turbulent. They're both very similar characters, unfortunately. I was never a bad person. You know, the only person I really caused grief with was myself. But I did, you know, we used to... Um, I used to go missing, you know, which is not... You know, it's, it's a bad thing to do, but um, I don't know if you're drinking or gambling. I wouldn't be up to the terrible things that people do when they go missing. I'd be sitting indoors thinking, you know, I had a lovely home. I had my dream home, swimming pool, snooker table, all the stuff that I dreamt, you know, that I wanted. And uh, But when I was at home, I just thought I could be out and about, you know, pretty, probably very selfish. You know, because I wanted, always wanted the action, really. 
We understood that yeah. he was away working. My mum always explained that he was working. And he'd always sort of come back loads of presents and tell us about where he'd been. He'd, obviously, China's a big competition, isn't it? So he'd bring us back Chinese dresses, take us to Chinatown all dressed up together, yeah. Probably on his behalf it might have been a guilt thing from being away, but we never felt that he should ever feel guilty because obviously we were so yeah. looked after and happy. My sisters and brother had a much no more normal, I'd say, childhood because I think they'd grown up, my mum and dad, to a certain degree by then. He'd never want us to worry about anything at all, ever, ever. And obviously he's only, although he's away, he's only on at the other end of the phone. But we'll ring and know if he's away or not, just from the dial tone. Oh, yeah, we will actually around. know where he is. He would ring me, because I, I'm here the most. He'd ring me and tell me, oh, I'm back on Tuesday, make sure the house is spotless. <laughs> so I'm rushing around cleaning. And it won't be Tuesday. And Wednesday comes, I'm calling yeah. him, what, what's happening? He wouldn't come back for another week. Yeah. It's just like that. The kids didn't know no different, because I've always, I've always um, been away playing snooker. So for them to see their dad go out the door and not come back for a week wouldn't, was no, nothing unusual. But obviously it was very hard on my ex-wife. And I apologise for that. Final frame, Jimmy White to Bryn. I think if I'd have won in 82, the way I was performing, you know, I might have uh, killed myself you know, because I'd have gone right to the very edge with the madness that was going on. Maybe he got success too soon and maybe thinking that, you know, he had nothing to prove, um, winning the World Championships and might have kind of got distracted and lost his way. Do you think it actually might have saved your life, literally? I think the 82 one, yeah. If I'd have been world champion in 82, I would have been... Um, 20, I think uh, it, it might have been too much for me, yeah. I've heard him say things like that. I'm not quite sure what he means by that, and I wouldn't particularly ask him, but it's interesting, isn't it? So Jimmy White concedes in a truly, truly superb semi-final. I just think he'd come up against someone who was destined to... To, to produce moments of brilliance like he did Alex Higgins at clearance. I don't think anybody else would have been able to do that. But the Crucible's like that. Strange things happen there and you just, you have to come through them moments. I seem to have my feet a bit more on the ground now. I'm like, uh, my affairs are sort of sorted out and I'm just sort of practising my snooker and trying to become a winner. My biggest ambition is to win the World Championship. Then I won the, the English amateurs and the England, uh, the world amateurs and uh, the world professional, then I, you know, I can relax then. The gambling started for me when I was about 14. I wasn't skipping school, it was all legal. I'd be off again on my antics. I can't really believe how I keep getting beat by so many months. It was like Tiger being let out the cage. I'm worth every penny. They certainly knew how to make stupid music in those days, they certainly did, sir. I'll look at the grain on that. <laughs> I've, been on, I've been on the road all my life, really, you know, so I intend to travel most of the year. He's brilliant, you know, he just, uh, you know, he just loves to perform, he's, you know, he loves, you know, and he's a pro as well. Well, it's not like life or death, you know what I mean, but... Um, yeah, you want to win, don't we? We all want to win, yeah. You know, whenever you go to do these stuff, you know, these exhibitions, he's always giving value for money to the crowd and, you know, he enjoys being there. Yeah! He's got a massive following all over the world, whether it's China, Bangkok, I mean, I've been places at Germany, you know, they, they adore him. Yeah, how are you? Oh, thanks, Jim. Pleasure. Nice to see you. Nice to see you, darling. Because he's never had any, you know, negativity when we're out, it's always been a nice, feeling, a nice thing, you know, he's, he's really light. You're moving from place to place to place. That doesn't worry you, you? No, no, it's because I've been doing it since I was about 15, see? So you get um, used to it in the end. Looking back, do you think you were, do you think you were happy at that point? Um, 
Was I happy? Um, sometimes, sometimes not. At balance, you know. When were you not? When, well, when you're recovering from a hangover. I'd go away to tournaments and then I'd go crazy again because I was out of the house and I could let loose. And um, so that made it even more harder for me to win because I was spending a lot of time at home. And then when I go away to the tournaments, it was like, you know, a tiger being let out the cage. I'd be off again on my antics. And you're young and you just think, you know what, I just want to be out with the lads. And that's, you know, that's why people loved him because he was just, uh, you know, um, just played, played snooker for enjoyment and enjoyed his life off the table. I basically have to tell him off like he's my child all the time. Yeah. <laughs> A bit, which is annoying because I, I don't, but I'm sort of that, I, that's my character anyway. I'm sort of in charge and everything. And he has to sometimes say to me, like, you're not my mother. And I say, yeah, I don't want to be his mother either, but because he does have those tendencies and he's quite easily um, bossed around. So I just, just boss him around a bit, yeah. <laughs> oh, it's beautiful, like, you know, to, uh, possess somebody like him, you know what I mean? And uh, it's lovely, it's, it's beautiful. My dad was a carpenter and I always remember I was about nine or ten and I used to spend Friday afternoon with him, like just after school. And we used to go to this Devonshire pub in Ballam and there was a pool table there and um, I sat in the corner for I think the first sort of ten Fridays or something and then all of a sudden I just started playing pool and then from the Devonshire pub I found a snooker club called Zans. Well when I was 13 I started playing snooker in Zans, a local snooker club and um, I sort of won a couple of competitions in about two years so I sort of I aimed to be a snooker player from then. I remember my brother brought me a, a bike he said do you want a snooker cure or a bike I was about 13 14 and I, and I didn't know really what I wanted to do but I felt all my friends had bikes, so I brought a bike. And the very next day I went down to snooker and it got nicked from outside the snooker. So um, that sort of, you know, made for sure then that I was just going to play snooker. I would be in a place when I was a kid for seven, eight hours a day. Went into this snooker, which was just such a fantastic atmosphere of all different characters right across the board, you know, from unsavoury characters to good characters to, you know, but they had principle amongst themselves. So it was a good education being there. In my day, you could do your Christmas shopping in there. <laughs> nice to see a granddad with his grandson arguing over the scores. <laughs> in them days, anyone could walk into the snow crawl. So we'd be in there. And the police would come in there and just say, you know, you've got your uniform jacket turned inside out, get back to school and all that. Well, I left school when I was about 15, and uh, my housemaster used to let me have time off in the end, so I wasn't skipping school, it was all legal. He made a deal with me. He said, if you go in in the mornings, I'll let you have the afternoons off. Because I was about 14 then, he could see that I had talent, and my actual schoolwork wasn't that good, so he knew that it was a good move for him to pursue my snooker career. Hopping the way from school, going in the snooker hall, I'm taking him back to school and back he's going again. Until I realised that he had got some talent and then I encouraged him. Did it worry you then? Yes, definitely. What, the lack of education? Well, not only that, at the point I didn't think the atmosphere was right for a young boy in the snooker hall that age. A regular day for me would be in the snooker hall win three or four hundred quid off somebody then go to the dogs and then if you won any money there you'd go to the casino and they used to, and if you had more money there you'd go and play in private card games you know it wouldn't be surprising that 14 15 years of age and this is like 35 years ago to have a thousand pound in your pocket you know and having no idea the value of money at all it was uh so it was just trying to make it 10,000 or if it went to nothing it didn't make no difference because the next day you was in a sort of situation where there was gambling again you know so even from from teenage years 
the gambling was there? The gambling started for me when I was about 14 and um, it stopped about 45 minutes ago. No. The environment was fascinating for me, but my biggest thrill was just potting balls. You know, from the age of 12, my love for the game has not changed. It's gone up and down over the years, but the full love for the game is still there. You're ambitious. I want to win the world. If I win the world championships this year, I'll be the youngest player to win it. Jimmy says that uh, his main ambition now is to win the world title. Above all else, do you think he will? I think the public thinks he's good enough. And I'm, well, I nearly said something then, but so, I hope so. <laughs> Davis, for me, was the hardest player to be. He, at my best, and um, he was the toughest player. You know, I played Ronnie O'Sullivan. OK, Ronnie O'Sullivan can annihilate you. But to me, Davis had a sort of a very all-round game. Jimmy sees the championship now drifting away from him. I lost to Steve Davis, 18-16. Wasn't bothered at all. In my mind, I thought there was no problem at all. A great performance then by Steve Davis. That's an amazing reaction to say you weren't bothered. Well, because I just thought uh, it was close. It was close enough. He won 18-16, and um, he fell over the line, sort of thing. It could have gone either way. And if I'd have played okay the first session, instead of going 12-4 down, you know, it might have been a different story. But you know, he held the trophy that year. I wasn't bothered at all. I didn't think it'd be no problem at all. Congratulations, Jimmy. It's his first final. Um... What was the balance between partying and snooker? There weren't no balance. No disrespect to the players that I beat, but I, my, my preparation was bad, you know, and um, obviously if I had my time again, I would have prepared better and I'd have won more, more tournaments, but uh, there was no balance at all, you know. I was, I was pretty selfish in a way where if I practised, I thought I could still go and drink and party and I'd be OK, but... Uh, Obviously, it catches up on you. So how much then do you think your, your style of play, as it developed, was a, a reflection of your character? Big time. Big time. Ten. Jimmy White. You know, it's just a joke how I keep getting beat. I can't really believe how I keep getting beat by so many months. No disrespect to some of the players. I can't believe it. I made it so exciting. You know, it was always double or none or, you know, this big particular shot. Yeah, it was a mug's way of doing it, really, but uh, it was the way that I got my thrill from. What I would do is, um, especially during the World Championships, I'd have half a lager before I'd go out to play. And then when the interval come, I'd go in the players' room, I'd have half a lager. Then I'd walk to the WPBSA room and have half a lager. Then I'd go to the embassy room, have half a lager. So by the time I'd gone back on, I'd had like two and a half pints. You know, but that used to settle me. But if people would, people just thought I was walking about, my people who was in my corner, my family, and that just thought I was um, just walking around saying hello, you know, just because I wasn't one of these people who just to sit in the dressing room and analyse the match. So I'd go on and I'd had two and a half pints or something, which obviously over two weeks period would catch up with you. It's never been an act. That's who I am. You know, I'm just me. I just, you know, I play the way I do. I act the way I act. You know, I don't change my, you know, my spots for nobody. Jimmy, I'll never change. Never just be the same plain Jimmy. You know, my Jimmy's, uh, he's always been solid in his mind. If he wants to do something, he'll do something. Oh, he'll get there. I was in the shower and I'd felt this small lump. I went to my doctor. He said, yeah, I don't like that at all. He was like the first rock star snooker player along with Alex Higgins. To me, he was my idol. He was so sad to see at the end. I, 
I was never taught anything. Um, I never had any technique. Um, mine was just, I just learnt to play myself just by potting balls. When my children ask him, you know, how do you do that? How do you screw back or how do you do a banana shot or whatever? He can show them, but he actually can't explain it. Oh, great shot from Jimmy White. So even in all that time, still he can't say, well, you've got to, you know, do this or do that. He just says, you just do that. And it's just obviously natural to him. Well, I'm like, yeah, OK. <laughs> How do you do that? Sometimes I'd be get down to play a shot and knowing it's the wrong shot and it's so hard to refuse one because I know if it went in, I'd win the game quicker. You know? He just kind of brought a, a whole different meaning to the game. You know, you see Jimmy walk in after, you know, he wouldn't play for six weeks, walk in with his suit, pick his cue up within one frame, knocks a maximum in, goes and wins a tournament while everyone else is doing six hours practice a day. And it was just like, you just couldn't get your head around it, you know. So Jimmy, Jimmy's just a, a maverick, if you like. Lots of cue power, can create breaks, for, for, you know, make lots of hundred breaks, the one four sevens, he, you know, he's got every shot in the book. Oh, well, that's a beautiful shot there. As my career got, got on and I was winning tournaments, I'd have won so many more tournaments if I'd have sort of um, pulled the reins in a bit, but I used to like to go for my shots. He's under tremendous pressure out there. And that was a bit undisciplined. That was the buzz that I got. I still go for far too many now, but um, that's what turned me on playing the game. That was my thrill of uh, pushing the boat out. Great player, this young fella. Very much in the Alex Higgins mould. <coughs> likes to go for his shots. 40. Likes to play them as quick as possible. In fact, I'm told that Alex Higgins... 15 has bet 300 pounds that Jimmy White will win this particular match. He literally, you know, it's like he was like the first rock star snooker player along with Alex Higgins. They were very different, but, but in their charisma they were the same, you know, because they were like, you know, the people's champion, if you like. They played with their heart on their sleeve. I think he looked at Jimmy as a younger brother and someone that was going to carry the mantle on from him. My Jimmy has made his game around Mr Alex Higgins. And, uh, no way would I ever say that that man was wrong, you know what I mean? To me, he was my idol, you know, as a snooker player, he played the game different to anybody else. He was a great shot maker. Um, he made the game of snooker. Without Alex Higgins, it, snooker wouldn't be as popular as it is. If I knew you were coming out of bed, he was my idol then I met him and we become pals and um, we had our ups and downs and um, unfortunately he was his own worst enemy you know and um, it was so sad to see at the end but you know, Higgins was his own man, and you know, and if he he refused help, so um, that was the way he was. Jimmy loved Alex, and I know how much he tried to do for him when when no one else would. You know, Jimmy would go and do lots of exhibitions here and put himself out just to try and help Alex in a way. How difficult to deal with was was the manner of his death. It was terrible because. Um, he died of malnutrition, he beat the throat cancer, but um, his sister would get him food, you know, I'd, I'd done things for him as much as I could, you know, I'd give him dough, but I mean, you know, he was a gambler, so that wasn't the, probably the thing to do. I offered him to come to London, and uh, we had people do things for him, but ultimately he went back to Belfast, he beat the throat cancer, his sister would, like bring food for him and uh, try and look after him but he didn't sort of look after himself and um, he died of malnutrition which is uh, you know a fucking liberty this day and age i was in the shower and i just felt this this small lump um, i went to my doctor 
Dr. Draper, and um, he said, yeah, I don't like that at all. And I literally went to Astid Hospital. They said they didn't like it. And uh, I was literally operated within 48 hours. I'd had the operation. And um, they found out that it was cancerous. So I was very lucky to have caught it very early. And, um, and then for the next five years, you go and have uh, tests every six months. And then it becomes, after two years, it becomes yearly. So, um, you know, to be around cancer and see, you know, this de devastating disease, what it does to everybody, uh, definitely a wake up call. So it just puts everything in perspective. You know, you just, um, one minute you're going along, everything's wonderful, and then all of a sudden you, you walk into cancer and it just knocks you for six. But I was very lucky that I didn't uh, go through too much treatment. I just had an operation. I lost my brother. He was quite young, sort of, you know, to watch my parents see them lose a child, you know, that was um, very difficult to sort of watch. But uh, we had quite a bad time. And so uh, it was quite, um, it's quite a sore word for us. When you lost your brother, did you lose your, your mother quickly afterwards? Yeah, my mum died about four, four months after, yeah. She sort of died of a broken heart. I remember him being quite cut up about that because it was in a short period of time that he lost his brother and his mum. And um, it's hard to see your parents upset about anything, but that's really the only time I've ever seen him quite down about it. I think it was just that it was a shock and it came around quite quickly. My mum was my best friend. You know, she was absolutely... Um, you know, just a wonderful, wonderful woman. Everybody loved her, friends, family, neighbours. He was like a hero to them and the whole family. And he, even as a very young person, obviously, he had to take on a lot. But he's close to his brothers and sisters and everything. And they're a very close family, but it's not... Um, obviously, it's a completely different childhood that they had than, than what we have. What's it like for you watching him? Do you get very worked up? Well... I'm like his mother, like, you know what I mean? You can't watch him properly, you know what I mean? Yeah, and, uh, yeah, it's, you know, it, it don't, you, well, naturally you get worked up, you know. My dad was um, very proud. He um, died, he was 88, and um, he lived with me and my sister for the last 10 years of his life. And, uh, but prior to that, he'd come with me for 25 years. But, um, no, my life was my life was good. You know, it was good fun. It was a close family. Do you find yourself getting nervous? When he loses, there's a little tear. When he wins, we're happy. You know, so naturally you're nervous all the time, aren't you? Well, that must be the happiest man in the arena, with the possible exception of you, Jimmy. Yeah, he's, he looked very delighted then, my dad. He follows you everywhere, doesn't he? I take him to most tournaments. I can't, I can't take him abroad and that, but he goes to most of the tournaments all over the country with me, yeah. Why can't you take him abroad? Well, I took him to Canada <laughs> once, and it was, you know, it was two weeks away from uh, home, and that's, uh, I, we, you know, I get tired, so he must get very tired. I was consistent from day one in the tournament. I, I kept my game together all the way through the tournament. Like, um, I was potting, consistent, the safety was good, you know, just perfect. Just listen to that applause for a really wonderful champion. So Jimmy Wright to the new United Kingdom champion. It was uh, very important to win that. I've been playing it 12 years. I've been beaten in the finals twice, so uh, I needed to win that one. It's about time. <laughs> Without being Larry, I was just too good. You know, I could be struggling and I could hit one good shot and it all clicked back into to form, you know, and my action would come back, my cue action, and uh, it would stay there. Because mine was all about touch and feel, you know. So um, that was a natural talent, so very, very lucky. I am not frightened of nobody. I'm enjoying playing snooker, so, you know, send them up. This Scottish kid called Stephen Andrews come along. He's beginning to annoy me. <laughs> he still believes he's going to win the world title. I'm still chasing the dream of being world champion. Nick 
nicknamed the whirlwind, Jimmy White admits to having led a hectic life of drinking and gambling and has been convicted of drink driving. In terms of the old demons, the old addictions, how are you now? Well, I don't smoke. That's why I've put on so much pudding. I very rarely drink. And uh, gambling, I have no interest whatsoever. Looking back, does it feel like you've come through this kind of almighty storm and now you're kind of in the calm or not? No, not in the calm. No, I still, I still, love, to, um, I still love to do things my way. But um, my main buzz now is playing snooker. It's always been playing snooker. But I just used to, you know, just get lost in different avenues. But my main buzz is playing snooker and I still love it as much now as when I was 15. <laughs> as well as a snooker, where are you? What kind of place are you in in your life generally? I'm in a fantastic place at the moment. I have a beautiful girlfriend in Southampton. I live there three days a week and I'm like three or four days in Epsom. I've got my uh, two daughters live with me. I have my son at the weekends. You all right, is he? Yeah, great. Yeah, he's at boarding school now. He tries yeah. to change the game up a little bit and entertain more people. Andy, how are you, mate? But it's good that he's going out and still, at what age he is, achieving what he's doing. He's working hard for my education and that proper drives him on. He's all for university, like, you must go to university. And when I'm saying about my sisters, like, they should be getting jobs, he said, no, they should be studying. They're young, they should just go back and do as much as they can. And I think, oh, OK. But I, I guess that's just from having no education. He's so sort of for learning as much as possible and getting as many qualifications as you can and yeah it's very important to him and also that's perhaps the only normal parenting that he's done maybe this tag the people's champion do you look on that tag fondly yeah oh, why do you think people the public at large took you to their hearts i just think you know i can be at home with anybody you know, it doesn't matter who they are, or where, wherever they come from. I'm just a, a normal fella, living the dream. Would you welcome, please, the whirlwind himself, Jimmy White? The majority of the public, you know, felt for me because, you know, they knew I was giving it my best and still playing the way I was playing. Then this Scottish kid called Stephen Hendry's come along, potting them off the lampshades. Stephen Hendry. 18 years old and without question the most dazzling talent to illuminate the game since Jimmy White six years ago. He's brilliant, he's fearless and like people think they like they play two or three safety shots. It's, it's a part of the game to play safe, but he'll play a few safety shots and all of a sudden a, an opponent will play a few safety shots. All of a sudden he'll knock one in like sort of off the lampshade or something and all of a sudden like they're, you know, they're gone. You know? Yeah, yeah. And I love that sort of scene, I love the way he plays, I think it's fantastic and very dangerous. He won 18-12. He just sort of outpotted and outplayed me. You know, he'd come from nowhere. You know, he'd just come on the scene. And, um, he was just a fabulous part of Stephen Hendry. I've never seen anyone pot so many crisp balls of him. You said after the first final, I wasn't bothered. When did you start to become bothered? Um, I was bothered when Parrot beat me even though he played very well because um, I was a big favourite and I was playing some real good stuff. He went 7-0 up the first session playing fantastic snooker and I could never catch him so he deserved to win. Obviously losing from 14-8 up with Hendry, I was sitting in my seat and I was literally um, thinking who I'm going to thank and who I'm not going to thank. And then all of a sudden, I sort of completely collapsed. Five. And he got stronger, and he won 10 on the spin. So that has always been a hard one to swallow. As Stephen goes out in a blaze of glory. I think the hardest battles was keep coming back to the World Championships, to keep coming back year after year. You know, it's, uh, that, that took courage, you know. And I just think it was unfortunate that he came up in an era when Stephen Injury was playing, because if it wouldn't have done, I'm sure he would have won the, the world title. 29. Got myself in a winning situation, and then Twitch, that's another one that uh, has been a nightmare. 
I was 17 each with him and I was, you know, more or less won it and I twitched on the black. I rushed the black. Jimmy White, 29. Well, did he see the title there, Dennis? Oh, dear me, that was just a little bit of tension. 17 hole at the Crucible, having had all them finals already under his belt, he hadn't won. That black was missable. Trust me, that any, anything's missable. Well, you saw it in his face then. No explanation needed. And under that pressure, you sometimes can't even feel your body, your arms, your fingers. You're so tight sometimes. You know, it wasn't a weakness of Jimmy. Stephen Henry has proved once again that he's the best player in the world. He's Embassy World Championship. He's won by 18 frames to 17 in one of the best finals you're ever likely to see. Even when I lost, you know, I'd have grown men crying in my hotel rooms and that, you know, where they couldn't really get round it. Oh, yeah, I'm delighted for Stephen Henry, but I could cry for this gentleman sitting in the chair there. I got as much excitement by playing the way I played as the people who watched it. And I think as the years went on, they started to feel sorry for me, keep getting beat. Jimmy, um, what can I say apart from happy birthday? <laughs> He's beginning to annoy me. I still get people come up to me now, you know, and uh, they're devastated. But uh, once they shake my hand and I sort of reassure them, you know, that uh, there's worse things happening in life and we're all right. I'll be back next year, that's all I can say. It must be very disappointing for him, but you wouldn't know it from, you know, any, every time he talks about it or his career or anything, you wouldn't necessarily think that it was a bad thing. And I think it's, it's just one of those things, it wasn't meant to be. Not his destiny rather than anything else just not meant to be. I'm proud of getting to six finals. I've won 10 ranking tournaments. I've won 46 invitation tournaments. I've won the world doubles, the world match play, you know, uh, the world amateurs, you know. It's this one tournament, obviously our Blue Ribbon tournament, it's um, one that I'm still chasing. I'm still chasing the dream of being world champion. You know, to get to six finals of a, of a game like snooker, playing the style of play I do, it, it's, it's a feat in itself. Jimmy is one of the most optimistic people I know. He still believes he's going to win the world title, and to have that belief in yourself is it's a good asset to have. If I didn't think I could win, I wouldn't play. And realistically, uh, you know, my boat has sailed. In my heart, I'd love to see it happen, but in my mind and... You know, knowing what it's like to go through that and knowing the standard of play, the type of players that are around, to me, I think it's highly unlikely. Um, you know, but, I, you know, it's, it's, it's not because he's not good enough. It's just that it's just that it's, it's a physical thing more, I think, you know. I still feel that um, if you can get it together and um, just, you know, keep practicing, keep working on your technique, which I'm doing at the moment, and I'm winning the game, so who knows, you know, I mean, I haven't given up yet, I haven't given up. And as long as my game's still there, there's no reason why I can't go on and win the World Championships. Obviously, you've got some fellow called Ronnie O'Sullivan there, who's in your way now, and you know, likes John Higgins, it's a lot harder, but it's not impossible. I can't see him wanting to give it up anytime soon and he sort of moans and pretends that he doesn't like the traveling and he um you know oh i've had to and i think oh come on he actually loves it he he could not not do it if you see what i mean even if he's got a couple of days off he's itchy you know when when he's going next what he's doing and that's his life you wouldn't go back and sacrifice all the parties and the good times being the person that the public love to be a world champion you wouldn't lose all that you wouldn't swap it no, I wouldn't swap anything, no. No regrets? No regrets at all. Sum up the life of Jimmy White, if you can. Just like a whirlwind. Simple as that. Yeah.
Who was fucking spinning? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Jimmy White. Another famous sports star is profiled next Tuesday night at 10 in more sports life stories. Next tonight, two cops, one woman, and a very shady underworld make for a great 90s crime thriller. LA Confidential is next on ITV4.